Lakeside. Good morning. Good morning. How y'all doing this morning? Good. Y'all cool? Yeah. All right, y'all doing extra cool. Huh? You better go morning. cool. You cold. Okay, all right, well, man, it's an honor and blessing. Uh, thank you to Pastor Dennis and the leadership here at Lakeside to have my wife and I back here today again to uh, just fellowship with you all and to also um, get into God's Word. Um, when I was praying and thinking about, you know, what am I going to come talk about today? On last time I was here, I shared my story. I'm not going to share my story in this fullness today, although I may mention a few pieces of that uh, throughout the message at the end. But I was thinking about this word that's really big in the church world, discipleship. If you, if you travel to many different churches, whether it be in Illinois, all the way to California, all the way to the East Coast, we keep hearing this word, discipleship. And so I was just thinking, you know, that's kind of a foreign word. Like, we don't use that word in our everyday vernacular. Um, but, like, what does the word discipleship mean? Well, it means a follower. It can be a follower of the teachings of anyone, but in the context of the Bible, it's talking about the following of Jesus the Christ, the anointed one. And, and Jesus' parting words for us in Matthew chapter 28, he tells his disciples, it's the resurrected Jesus, he says, you, you go and make disciples. I've discipled you for about three years of, of my pastoral ministry, and now it's time for you to sprout wings, to fly the nest, and you go out and make disciples. And so he's basically saying, you go and you pass on the teachings that I've given you. It's pretty simple, but it seems to be one of the most difficult things, one of the biggest challenges that is in our church world. If you were to ask people in this room, have you been discipled? I would say statistics would say probably less than 30% will raise their hand. The discipleship isn't going to church every Sunday. Discipleship isn't going to a small group once a week. Um, it's not going to a prayer group or service, although those things are good and those things are necessary. That is not discipleship. It's a part of it, but it's not the full scope of discipleship. And so as we think about discipleship, um, I believe it has many parts, but this morning I want to focus on what it takes to be a disciple. In order for us to know this, all we simply have to do is look and see what Jesus said. What did he say? So today we're going to look at five passages and, and just talk about them. For a few minutes. If you have a Bible, smartphone, tablet, whatever kind of device, or if you just want to just listen, I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 26. That's Matthew 16, 24 through 26. This is Jesus talking to his disciples again. He says, Jesus told his disciples, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever was saved his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. It's kind of like an oxymoron or, or, or paradox or something, right? It's kind of weird how Jesus said, I think he say Jesus cold-blooded, right? But the way he says things, it makes you think, right? And I know this passage really makes me think. In verse 26, he says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits his soul? What will it profit you if you gain everything the world says you should have, but on the flip side, on the other side, you lose your soul? I would say that's no profit at all. I would say no matter what you've acquired this side of, of heaven or hell, depending on where you stand with Jesus, all that stuff is going to be for nothing because you can't take it with you. And we've all heard that before. I believe it's quite simple for us to see how to be a disciple of Jesus. is denying yourself, picking up your cross, and following him. The first thing I want to look at is denying yourself and ask the question, what does this really mean? I actually asked this question twice of two different groups of people, and I got the same answer. They said that it means not to sin. And I was kind of perplexed or dumbfounded because I, I don't really see it that way because, you know, we all know that, that the call that God has for our lives is that we accept His Son, Jesus Christ, and that we abstain or stay away from sin. So that's a given, right? Like, that's a given. It's kind of like when you have those um, uh, people are giving up things, like for Lent, and they say, well, I'm going to quit cussing, or I'm going to quit getting high. And it's like, you should be doing that stuff anyway, right? Like, this is an occasion to stop sinning. We should stop sinning every day of our lives, period. So if that's true, if that's the case, then what does denying yourself mean? I think it means denying ourselves things in this world that are not sin, that can become idols, 
are things that grab so much of our time and our resources that it takes us far away from God. And those things can become sin, but they're not sin in and of themselves. For instance, I think about people who are all about their career, right? This world teaches us you want to have a career, and if you want to be successful, you'll have a successful career. And the more success you want means the more time that you put into your career. And we know that people, if they're really focused on their career, there's a whole lot of things you can kind of leave by the wayside. Like if you're married, you're not going to have that successful marriage. If you have children, where are you going to be in the discipleship and spiritual formation of your children's lives when you're over here putting in hours and hours and hours trying to gain a successful career? And oftentimes with that, there's prestige that comes with the titles, you know, CEO, CFO, COO, and all those roles. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of prestige that comes along with that, right? And also with that prestige comes what? Comes the bands, right? Comes the dollars. You know, and that's a different type of prestige because that's linked to the houses we have, the cars we drive, the vacations we take, the clothes we wear, and what we get our kids involved in. Oftentimes we can find ourselves so ingrained in the lives of our children. Now get this, I don't have any indictment against parents loving their children and being for their children. But I would ask the question, if you are so consumed with trying to get your children involved in every extracurricular activity that there is, where is the spiritual formation in their life? Where is the time that you are using to dedicate to service for the Lord? Because you are vicariously, in some instances, living your life through your children. In other words, you're trying to give them the life that you didn't have, therefore you're living your life through them. That's not the lens of which God has to live our lives through. The lens that we live our lives through Christ's following is simply through denying ourselves and picking up our cross and follow Jesus. This is the call that God has given us for us to do. I believe that he's not telling us to conform to this world. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he says, Don't be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, my brothers and sisters, I think it's pretty simple. The world that we live in is indoctrinating us with all these worldly concepts and all these ideas. And these things are very, very much so against the gospel that Jesus came to present. It's against the very precepts of his word, which we get the Holy Bible, that we have this rift, right? We have this internal tension where we see what God's word says. We hear, see, and understand what the world says, and there's this pull, right? There's a Holy Spirit that's trying to pull us out of the world, because in some of us, we got both feet in the world. Some of us got both feet in the world, and some of us got one foot in each. What God calls us to is both feet over with him. That's what he's calling us to. He's saying, deny yourself these things. Deny yourself. If you can be have a successful career, there's nothing wrong with having a successful career, but is it pulling you away from God? Is it pulling you away from your family, your wife, your children? Is it pulling you away from serving the Lord? Jesus didn't come to, to, to be served, but to serve. Right? That's what Mark's whole gospel is predicated on. The servant of God. Jesus, Mark presented Jesus as a humble servant. Right? And if we're going to, to follow Jesus, then we need to what? We need to follow Jesus. We need to be serving. And although you may serve on a Sunday morning, and I know you got a portable church, there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of areas to serve, and it's great for all of you that, that sacrifice some of your time to help put all this together on Sunday. But it doesn't just end on Sunday. It just doesn't end on Sunday because there's so many injustices in the world today. Right? And the world is good about these injustices, right? They throw money at it, they throw problem solving at it. But as Christ followers, we know the solution to the world's problems is one thing and one thing only. It's Jesus. That is the only answer for the injustices of our world today. It is Jesus, a crucified Christ, who came to live and die and rise again to, to solve all these problems. And where are we in that? Right? If we have to rely on, on Pastor Dennis. To, to preach to everybody in this whole area, guess what? He gonna fail. He gonna fail because that's not the plan. The plan is for him to be equipping the saints, to be equipping you, to be pastors, to be teachers, to be disciple makers in your community, in your neighborhood, 
working at your job with your family at Jiffy Lube and at Meyer or all these shopping, wherever you shop at, God is calling us to be light of the world. But in order for us to do that, we got to deny ourselves. We got to look at our time and say, what are we utilizing our time for? Is it to build my kingdom or is it to build the kingdom of God? See, God only has a plan A. Right, we're taught to have a plan B and plan C and, and so on and so forth in, in, in case plan A or B don't work, right? But see, God only has a plan A because it's going to work. The question is, are you going to get on board with it? Are you going to get on board with God's plan? If you are, that's the first step is denying yourself. Is denying yourself these worldly pleasures. And again, I'm not talking about sin. I'm talking about maybe it's taking less expensive vacations and sowing that, that, that extra finance that you have left into the kingdom of God. I'm saying it's denying yourself going out here with your kids and getting them involved in everything for their sake, but taking them to a, 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 a Feed My Starving Children session or taking them to a, a homeless place and doing some ministry work, praying with people, witnessing to people and telling them about the love of Christ that encountered your life and changed you and shaped you and molded you into the person that you are today. It all starts with denying yourself. There's a guy named um, William Wyden Gordon. He was born November 1st, 1887 in Chicago, Illinois, to a very wealthy family that made their, man and made their fame and fortune in silver mining in Colorado. As a high school graduation present, he was given a chaperone trip around the world. But well, I, I wouldn't mind having one of them. Come on. And it was during this trip he decided what he wanted to do with his life. Because he saw such injustices and poverty in other countries, he wanted to give his life to that. So he came back home and started educating himself. He graduated from Yale in 1909, and then right after that he got a theological degree from Princeton. And this is an educated brother. This is an educated brother. He became uh, one of the directors at Moody Bible Institute at the age of 22. And it was during this time when the Lord spoke to him and told him specifically what he wanted him to do. He wanted him to go to China and minister to Islamic people in northern China. And so he denied, decided to give up everything that he had. His fame, right? His fortune. He was up there with the Rockefellers. You heard the name Rockefeller before, right? They're one of the richest families ever on this planet. This family was right up there with the Rockefellers back then in the early 1900s. He was famous in Christian circles and even in the worldly circles. Everybody knew who he was. They knew the potential that he had. He could have had any job. He could have done anything. He even could have done nothing. And just sat off the fatness and the riches that his family had. But see, he decided to deny himself. Because he saw a bigger call. He saw a bigger purpose in his life. He gave up the family fortune. He gave up the prestige um, that he was gaining because of his education and influence he had. He saw no value in those things, but in the call from Jesus, he denied himself. One of his friends said, what are you doing? You're throwing your life away. That's what the world is going to tell you, right? What are you doing? You have the means. You have the time. You have the prestige, you have the fame, you have the fortune. Why are you living like this? Why are you doing this? Why are you denying yourself all these things that make us have this life of comfort and feel so good? Because that's a worldly perspective. That's not a perspective that God had. But you see, he never made it to be a missionary though. While studying Islam and the Arabic language in Egypt, he contracted a deadly disease and died at the old, old age of 25, 25 years old. But see, William understood the big picture. He understood that his life was not his own and that there was a bigger purpose than acquiring worldly fame, fortune, and the like. He was obedient to God just like we all should be. After his death, his, his Bible was found, and, and written in the back of it was, was three, three, three phrases. No reserve, no retreat, no regret. No reserve, right? I'm not living a life of storing up things. A reserve, right? I'm not trying to fed my IRA or my 401k so I can live comfortably at some point in my life. I don't want any reserve. I'm giving myself to you, Lord. My time is yours. My life is yours. He said there's no retreat. He's not going to run from the hard things. He's not going to run from the difficulties that life is throwing his way because of the, the lack of comfort that he could have. A lot of us are looking for comfort, right? A lot of us are looking for comfort. 
And that's a worldly perspective. Because if we parallel our lives to Jesus, he didn't have a place to lay his hand. Right? Did he live a comfortable life? I think not. And last, he said no regret. He didn't regret this. Again, because he had a bigger vision. He had a bigger calling and mindset that knew that the call on every Christian's life was giving their life to Christ, was denying themselves and picking up their cross and following him. That's denying ourselves. But what does picking up our cross mean? This is simply enduring the shame and suffering that we endure while following Jesus. Right? Jesus literally, remember, he picked up his cross, right? He had Simon with him to help him carry his cross. This is the suffering that we're going to endure. Christ follower, I got news for you today. If you're not encountering any suffering in your life, then I think that bears to ask yourself the question. Are you really serving the Lord? Are you really serving the Lord? Because serving the Lord, you're going to encounter some suffering. But again, we don't want to suffer, right? If you're anything like me, I like comfort. I like the comfortable chair at home. I like the comfort of my automobile. That I got blessed enough to have the heated seats. I wish I had this heated steering wheel, but, but, but that didn't come with it. But, but you get what I'm saying, right? I want the comfortable shoes. I want the, the comfortable pants. Like, like everything in our, our world is telling us, man, have comfort. I mean, if you go to any shopping center, what do you see? You see like two or three mattress stores, right? Comfort, comfort, comfort. That's what the world is teaching us, but Jesus is saying, well, the life ain't about comfort. Life is about serving me. It's about picking up that cross, that suffering that he endured, we're going to endure. And when we do, you know what that means? That means we're partnering with Jesus. We would be so blessed, so blessed, if we can encounter any kind of shame and suffering that Jesus encountered in his life, because then we can identify with what he went through for us. I mean, he did it for us, y'all. I mean, that's what I believe the scriptures teach. I believe that's what the scriptures teach. Soon, because of the way the world is, right, we, we got comfort food, we got comfortable technology. We ain't got to go to the grocery store, right? We can just go online and order some food and bam, it's brought to us and, and now deal dash is pretty much, uh, I mean, not deal dash, door dash is, is making the fast food restaurants like you don't even need to go to the drive-thru window no more. That, that ain't fast enough, right? I can just have Taco Bell and McDonald's bring it right to my doorstep. Where am I at? It'll just bring it to me. Comfort, comfort, comfort. Soon we'll never have to leave our homes. And we can just be comfortable and sit in our jammies all day. Don't that sound, that sound kind of good this morning? I bet it's something people doing it this morning, right? At home sitting in their jammies. But the point is, right, God doesn't call us to live a life of comfort. He calls us to a life of carrying our cross. See, we don't like pain and suffering. Oftentimes, we do whatever it takes to be more comfortable, no matter what the cost. Are we suffering for Jesus, or are we taking the pathway to comfort? Are we standing up for the cross, or are we running away from it? I'm going to say that again. Are we standing up for the cross, or are we running away from it? Because if we stand up for it, that's when the suffering comes. And when we run, we run from the suffering and shame to a comfortable place. That's what we do. Our Savior didn't run, and neither should we. And I'm thankful for that. He didn't have to run to the cross. He could have just snapped his fingers and everybody would have dropped dead. He could have just disappeared and been gone, right? He could have done a, a, a zillion things other than what he did. But he endured that cross for us so that we can have a new life in him. In the book, what if Jesus meant what he said, the author writes, when Jesus tells us to deny self and take up our cross, this is not a punishment, but a privilege. It's a privilege, right? And for those of us that have committed our lives to Christ, we live a privileged life. Because our Father is the God of all creation, right? We, we should never want for nothing. His word says he's going to take care of us. He's going to take care of us. And when this whole body gets sick and, and decays and dies, guess what? He gives us a brand new one where we spend eternity in heaven with him. You know, if, if, if Christ ain't your Savior, you don't have that privilege. You don't have that right. You can get to go kick it with your dad and the devil for eternity in the lake of fire and be hot. Right? I, I like to be hot right now, but not that type of hot. Because that's going to melt you right there. That's some, that's some heat. And lastly, what does it mean to follow him? Jesus said, if you want to save your life, you must lose it. This is that paradox again, right? If you want to save it, you must lose it. If you 
want to save your life, you must lose it. This is how we follow him. We lose our lives, y'all. And we don't literally lose them, right? Like, we're still alive. Right. What does it mean to lose our lives? It means lose our lives in him. Right. It means to love him. We can never love him as much as he loves us, but we can try. Yeah. Right? We can make a concerted effort every day to say, Jesus, what do you have for me today? Yeah. Instead of me worrying about my kingdom and how I can build it and advance it, maybe it's the mindset of God. How can I help build your kingdom and advance it? That is the mindset that we should have as Christians. We should let him be in total control. We should be in submission to him. Jesus used the illustration of gaining the world and losing your soul. What good is it, is it to have everything but to have nothing? What good is it to have everything but to have nothing? Because in the world's eyes, in this, this world of comfort and, and running from the cross, Right? It's this idea of us gaining our life. So many things in this world is trying to help us preserve our lives because we don't want to die. And, and granted, like we shouldn't be suicidal, we should be wanting to die, but, but we never die. Right? For those in Christ, we never see death, the word of God says. All we do is just transfer from one place to another. The writer of Colossians says that our citizenship is in heaven. If you're in Christ today, that means you got a place in heaven. You are a citizen of the kingdom of God presently, right now, today. We never die. When a person dies, you go to a funeral, if they're a Christian, that's a celebration. Although it leaves us sad in the flesh, right? We know where they are because we understand what God's word says. We understand what God's word says. It's not, and it's, I think about tomorrow as we celebrate um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. I think about what an incredible example of denying himself and following, following Christ, right? What a better example. I mean, this was a famous man, right? Why was he famous? Because he stood up for injustice. He was tired of seeing Satan take advantage of human beings, people who God loved, people who Jesus died for. So he stood up, and in his standing up, what did he do? He stood up and he picked that cross up. He picked that burden up. That for many of us in this room, if it wasn't for him, for him, what would our lives look like today? What would it look like today? We may not be able to be in this gym if you're a person of color. You might not be able to be in this gym, and if you were, you probably wouldn't be able to stand up before this podium with God's word over. There's a good chance that because he fought against those injustices, he picked his cross up, he was spit on, he was ridiculed. He said Chicago was the worst city he ever came to because he was rocks was thrown at him and he was hit upside his head. I couldn't believe that when you think about the South and how racist they were, but he said Chicago was the worst city he ever visited. The most racist city that he ever visited. He was the very epitome of Matthew chapter 5 when Jesus said, turn the other cheek. Jesus said some hard stuff, y'all. If you haven't read it, I encourage you to get in here and read about it. He said, turn on the cheek, and that's what Dr. King did. He taught nonviolence. When the world was saying, you go and do something, when the Black Panther Party and Malcolm X, I would say, which was, would be the opposition, where they were saying, we need to arm ourselves, and we need to do something. We need to pick up the sword. Dr. King said, no, we don't pick up the sword. We put down the sword, and we pick up the king. We pick up the cross, better yet. Right? We follow Jesus. And look how Jesus used his life. Was he a perfect man? No. No man was except Christ. He was the only perfect man. But he was an imperfect man that had a call from God, that saw an injustice that God burned his heart for, like William Borden, and he said, you know what, I'm going to give myself to this. I'm going to deny where I can just go to my church and pastor and have a good life and, and build a big ministry, and that'll be good. There's nothing wrong with that. But he said, I'm going to deny these things that I can have, and I'm going to stand up for people that don't have a voice. I'll be the voice for the voiceless. And God gifted that man in such a way that today we have the, the privileges that we have in the United States of America. Because the one man decided to pick up his cross and to follow Jesus. We should be encouraged this morning. We should be praying and asking God, what injustice can we give our lives to? Because that's what following Jesus means. Right? It means if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to stand up against sin, you're going to stand up against the world, the things of the world, and you're going to plug yourself into them. 
And it's gonna cost you, y'all. I'm gonna tell you, it's gonna cost you, man. It's gonna cost you some heartache. It's gonna cost you some pain, some stress, some frustration. But what you get to do is enjoy this privilege of picking up this cross that Jesus once picked up, picked up, and partner with Him in that mission. I know for me, when I first encountered these verses, it was in a maximum security prison with life in 100 years. And I, and I saw that and I was like, you know what, that's me. I was trying to gain the world, right? I didn't want to lose my life, although I was selling drugs and then drive-by shootings and the like, putting myself in situations to lose my life. Why? To gain the world. See, oftentimes, we'll, we'll step over the line of justice and government to try to achieve and have things that the world says you need to have to be successful and to make you somebody, right? And it'll put your life in danger. It'll put other people's lives in danger. And that's what I was doing, thinking that I was preserving my life, thinking that I was really gaining something. But what I was really doing was losing my life. And that's what happened. When that judge just gaveled in and said guilty, and they gave me the sentence, life plus 100 years at 19 years old, for me, my life was over. I was like a zombie. I was a dead man, but I was still alive. But see, it was when I encountered Christ, when I went to go take a man's life, because he gave me a gift, that I encountered Christ. That I saw that, that God had something greater for me. That he had a call for my life. Just like he does all of our lives, because see, me and Pastor Dennis, we ain't nobody special. We just with some people that's crazy enough to say, God, if you want us to, to get in your word and, and preach your word to people, then we'll do it. Right? We, we crazy enough to do that. They say public speaking is the most fearful thing there is in the world. I think spiders or snakes is next, which is kind of crazy, right? They say public speaking is the scariest thing, but we've decided to say, you know what? We're not going to let fear dominate our lives. That's what we must have the mindset of if we're going to pick up this cross and follow Jesus. Fear can't be a part of it. Right? Faith. Faith has to be the reason. We have to have faith. And God has given us all a measure of faith. And if you're a Christ follower today, he's giving you faith. It may be as small as a grain of mustard seed, but the Bible says that will move them out. <laughs> so if that's all you got, you got some power. Right? And God is your daddy. The only God, the true and living God that created everything that owns all things. So that little bit of faith you think you might have that might not be enough, I'm going to tell you that they don't believe a lie. Satan wants you to believe that you don't know enough, that you ain't good enough, that you got too much sin in your life. These are all the things he wants you to believe to keep you from clinging close to the cross and picking that deal up and following Jesus. But I want to tell you today that the life that God calls us to is the best life ever. You may be thinking, how can suffering and shame be the best life ever? I'm saying it's the best life ever because the, the community that God allows you to be in, the blessings that you see, the understanding that you know of God that other people don't know to help you navigate life is unlike anything. And if you don't believe me, give it a try. There's it's some naysayers in the crowd, no doubt. There's enough people in here for it to be some non-Christ followers in here. You don't believe what I'm telling you? Give Christ a try. Understand that you are sinner. And that what you deserve is, is death. That's what we all deserve. We don't deserve justice. Or we deserve justice. But instead, God gives mercy for those that ask for it. He extended his grace towards us so that we can know him, have a relationship with him. And that will then enable us to deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow him. You see, I decided around 20 years old that um, that this life I was living, man, it wasn't a good life. It was putting my life in danger, other people's lives in danger, and that I had essentially ruined my life. And maybe there's some people in here today that you feel like your life is ruined or you're on the brink of ruining your life and you feel like you have no hope. Well, I can tell you with life in 100 years and then quickly after getting two more life sentences, that was the nail in the coffin, so to speak, right? I wasn't ever getting out of the penitentiary. But I said, Jesus, you know what? It don't matter if I get out of the penitentiary. What matters is what my life looks like for you. Because you did something that no man has ever done. You died for me. A lot of people that say they'll die for somebody, you don't know what you would do when you face that opportunity. You may die for them. You may break and run. You may freeze up. But Jesus did nothing but run to that cross. And he ran to that cross for us. So for you today, if you haven't accepted Christ as your Savior, 
Man, he offers that grace to you. The unmerited favor, something that you don't deserve, he offered that for you. Thousands of years ago when he died on that cross, he said, all you got to do is come to be humble. All you got to do is, is confess your sins, Romans 10, 9. You confess your sins and believe um, that God raised Jesus from the dead, you'll be saved. Right? I know it's a lot to believe because we weren't there, but that's where this word faith comes in. If your life is ruined so you think, or is on the brink of being ruined so you think, Christ will give you new life. And that's what he did for me. And after 15 and a half years of being in prison, he said, it's time for you to go. It's time for you to go, and he let me out of prison. And that's just it, right? There was no more, there was no judge, there was nobody that did anything to make that happen, but God, with his goodness and his mercy, saw fit. And then he sent me on a mission. He said, son, if you really want to deny yourself, if you really want to pick up your cross and follow me, I got something for you, son. Because that's why I let you out of prison. I said, all right, God, come on with it. <laughs> let me get there. You know what he said? He said, I let you out of prison just to send you back. Come on. Come on. Come on. I said, hey, God, if that's the cross I got to bear, there's no fame and fortune in that. You know, there's no lot of money in, in prison ministry, ministry, period, for most of but not prison ministry. That's the bottom of the barrel. There's nothing good for that but those men and women who are valuable. Some of us, those are our relatives and friends and neighbors, co-workers. They have value. Jesus died for them like he died for us. And he said, I want you to go and I want you to tell them about my goodness so that that slave to sin can be set free. And that's what I leave you with this morning. You, if you're a slave to sin, you can be set free. Christ is the only way to be set free of your sins. And I pray to encourage you all who have accepted Christ to evaluate your life and ask yourself, am I really denying myself? Am I trying to build my kingdom, my kingdom of comfort? Or am I going to start focusing on God and enduring some of this suffering and shame by picking up my cross and serving Him? Do an evaluation. Ask yourself. Go through a list of what you're doing with your life and see some areas that you can give up and start serving Him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for your word because in it we can understand and know God, His nature, and we can get and understand our Savior, Jesus. I just pray for all of us this morning, Lord God, that these words of yours can soak into our hearts and our minds, Lord, that they can come out of our hands and in our feet. And for the ones that are here that don't know you, Father, I pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit will just make their lives a living wreck. Wreck their hearts and wreck their minds, Lord. Draw them to you. Help them recognize who they are outside of you. But then let them know that you got something greater for them, Lord. A life that's unlike any other. It's everlasting life. It's that living water that you provide for all who come to you. We thank you so much, Lord, for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.